Okay, so I would say that this is it. Anybody who will join will be joining in now. So thank you again for, for selecting our session. We will be talking about the sustainable urban mobility indicators and we will explain what we learned about these indicators, what we have and what's our plans and, and ambition with the, with the system, what we have prepared. We will have a big panel of uh, presentations and, and, and speakers to share their, uh, their views and, and knowledge about this. So first of all, my name is Robert Switch. I work at the European Commission in the unit for uh, urban mobility. I will be moderating the session and on my left I have uh, Marcel Brown from Ruprecht Consult who are working on the, the developing uh, the indicator set together with us. And we will have um, Hans Martin Neumann from the Austrian Institute of Technology who will also explain what they are working, uh, what they are doing in terms of uh, urban mobility indicators as regards the net zero cities. And we will have uh, three city representatives who will present briefly their uh, experience and, and, and knowledge through testing and working with us through the pilot phase or by other means. So we will have uh, Diana Kimmer from Budapest Transport Authority, then Mikiel Penne from Antwerp, the city of Antwerp, and uh, Stella Altonen from the city of Turku. And at the end of the session, we will sh close with a Q&A. So obviously, we will be listening to, through I think it will be Slido. We will uh, be ready to answer to your questions uh, if the time allows. And at the very beginning, uh, before we start, we have two very quick Slido questions to have an understanding of what you know about these indicators. Could we have them on the screen, please? So technically, have you heard about the sustainable urban mobility indicators? Before, obviously. It seems we have a good audience. You are very knowledgeable, probably better than, than we are. And, and for the second question, is your city planning to work with the mobility indicators? Okay, that's also quite a, quite a positive either you are busy with indicators already or in the process of setting up such, uh, such systems or, or the no probably should have been not yet <laughs> because it will come probably everywhere. And okay, thank you. Thank you for the questions. So on my side, I have prepared a few slides. So if I can get the, the clicker, just to give you a little bit of the, the, the rationale behind this thing, I will stand here so I can watch what's going on in there. So colleagues, could you please start the slides for uh, So why are we working on these indicators and what's the whole point of, of these academics? I think it was mentioned yesterday, academics and, 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 and difficult formulas. So the main reason behind is that for the sums, we have plans. Everybody can have plans and we need to work on implementing our plans. We, have, we are setting objectives, we need to measure. Are we on a track, good track, to meet our objectives? Are we actually getting closer at all? The set of measures we defined in our plans, are they making the impact, the scale of the impact we want to achieve or, or not? Are we okay in terms of time? So we need to know, are we on, 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 on the right track? And, and obviously indicators, data, Will will feed back to your policy side, to your 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 planning, your policy making uh, cycle, to confirm that actually yes, it's reassuring. You are on the you are on a good path or not or not fast enough. Then then we need to change. We need to adjust. We need to adapt our plans, 
be more bold, more ambitious, or sit back and lay back. Yes, we are on a perfectly fine track uh, as we prepared. So, 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 but but we need to know this uh, this feedback. We need to know where we are, and if we are going in 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 a in a direction, is it a good one, and is it the the proper one, and it will lead to the to the place where we want to be in in, in the amount of time that is available to us. So this is a. Uh, our understanding that for the sums we have a very good uptake, but for the data, for the feedback, for the monitoring, monitoring systems, we can we feel that we can further improve. We have a room to to, to work, to continue, and and make the, the, the plans more robust, to to be more evidence based, more factual, so we can actually understand that act we are working in, the, in, in 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 a good way, and in a good direction. So. In the urban mobility framework last uh, December, we had a communication where we, under, where we presented this, uh, this, this issue, this, this need for, uh, for data, for, for making uh, the, the urban mobility plans more robust. And, and we proposed that we, want, we will work from, from the Commission's side uh, uh, towards, uh, towards this direction and, and to make sure that we have uh, some sort of standardized data available to, to cities to work with and, and can also be aggregated to, to member state and, and European level to do some sort of benchmarking, identify good practices, uh, better practices, because this is what we feel as important coming from, from the urban mobility policy angle. At the same time, together with the, the urban mobility framework communication, the Commission tabled also a propo uh, proposal for revising the TANTI regulation. And within this uh, regulation, we also included our ambition towards the urban nodes specifically, that overall for cities, we obviously want to have indicator indicators to capture, to measure, but for the key system, the key cities on, on, on the network and on the European uh, transport networks, we propose that actually we want you to, so we want, we required, or we proposed uh, the cities that they will be uh, collecting and submitting uh, these uh, urban mobility data to the, to the commission, by, by 2025, obviously the discussions are still ongoing in Council, so this was the Commission's proposal. And we selected a few of the SUMI indicators, what we have prepared originally. So technically we proposed uh, a few of them that we felt from, from our point of view that are the most relevant from a European perspective to, to aggregate and to capture, meaning greenhouse gas emissions, congestion, deaths and, uh, deaths and serious injuries caused by road crashes, model share, access to mobility services and data on air and noise pollution in cities. So these are the ones what we, what we felt that we would like to have a European uh, level of uh, data available for us for the 424 uh, biggest uh, cities in, in, in the EU. So just very briefly, I don't want to spend a lot of time because Marcel will explain the details of uh, what happened in the first project of the Sustainable Urban Mobility Indicators. We call it SUMI, uh, uh, SUMI 1 project. So we were running a pilot project for the past couple of years to get an indicator set because there was nothing European available before that. So we developed uh, together with our consultants and, and, and colleagues from, from, from abroad as well, uh, a set of uh, 19 uh, urban mobility indicators with a standardized methodology and formulas to, to capture key aspects of, uh, of urban mobility. We ran a test within 50, with 50 cities to see actually do they work? Can we get the data? Are they available? And, and so on. And, 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 and to, to see what the feedback is and what, uh, what, what the lessons learned are. We also developed a little benchmarking tool with data to see how cities are compared to the benchmark, so the average of, uh, of, of the different values for the indicators. The idea is not to name and shame, but to see are you better or behind, so you have a room to improve compared to the others. So this is a feedback for the cities to see how, how well they perform on, on some indicators compared to the others. I mean, compared to the average of, of, of the 50 cities in this specific case. And now we are working on the second phase of the SUMI project to, feed, to actually build and incorporate the feedback, what we learned from the, from the first phase, to simplify, streamline the methodology, to make sure that the data is available as easily as possible, obviously simpli simplifying the formulas, the academics behind as well, but not destroying everything because the, uh, without academics, this is, I mean, data, you need to be precise. 
and our, uh, our ambition is that we will have by the end of the year a uh, stable indicator set available for use and next year uh, we will prepare a topic guide on the indicators to share everything what we learned during, the, during this process and as a next step afterwards. So overall, as you see, we have a stage approach. So we are planning one step after the other. So first, obviously, we finish with the, with the indicator set by end of this year. At the same time, we are working already with the cities mission. So the cities uh, selected, 100 cities selected under the mission for this climate neutrality, we will offer support to them to develop their indicator system, at least for urban mobility. So they will be able to track and, uh, and, and keep control of what's going on in their cities. And we will uh, launch um, from, from Connecting Europe facility a program support action, a technical assistance uh, call for, for member states to, to actually fund cities to start collecting their data and build up their indicator systems. So this will be the first call from the staff available for the, for the indicators. Obviously, we have to finish the indicator set before, so that's why it is uh, staged behind, so afterwards. And we expect that many others will follow in, in, in this regard. And I stop here, and I give, my, give the mic to, to my colleagues. So, Marcel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Is this, oh, okay, thank you. Okay, so I'll use this microphone. Um, so it would be nice if you could put up the presentation uh, of Marcel Brown, which is me. Uh, so, hello, everyone. I'm Marcel Brown from Ruprecht Consult. Um, based in Cologne, in Germany. Um, I must say it's quite an impressive stage here. I feel like I have to sing out this presentation to you with a live band in the background, but I'm not going to do that, so no worries. Um, so I'm, um, I have coordinated the uh, first SUMI project, and uh, I'm actually now coordinating the uh, follow-up project, the second uh, uh, SUMI project, which is uh, in a contract together with, uh, with the Altis project. Um, I have a couple of slides, I will go through many of them quite quickly, um, but uh, I'm not sure but it has been mentioned before. All the slides will actually be available from the um, mobility website after the conference, so you can download them and have a closer look. Um, also, um, I'd like to mention that we're also part of the previously mentioned Net Zero Cities project that is supporting the 100 mission cities um, in, in their endeavor to become climate neutral by 2030. Um, okay, I have also a little bit of background that has been mentioned, but I will go over this uh, quite quickly. Uh, the relation to uh, SUMP, which is the starting point, um, there is now more than 1,000 SUMPs uh, across Europe already. Uh, and of course, there's a strong interest uh, to also learn about the effectiveness of the SMP and its measures, uh, have they really achieved uh, what they have been designed for? And this is where the uh, sustainable uh, mobility indicators come in as a tool to support really the measuring of the uh, success and objectives of an, of an SMP and to also help finding areas where there's deficiencies um, and where improvements could be made in terms of uh, policies and measures. Um, the framework, I don't have to explain it to you, and also the 10T background has been explained. Uh, it probably should be added that also the EIB recommends SUMP for infrastructure financing proposals. You've all seen the circles uh, for SUMP. I don't go into detail on that. Um, and um, many of you know the SUMP guidelines. Uh, indicators are mentioned there. There's even an, a definition of the indicator, which I've mentioned here, so a clearly defined data set to monitor the progress, as I've mentioned, uh, to measure the performance of an SUMP. So this is um, where the, the story is uh, embedded in. Um, it's also a part of this quadrant here. So how to determine this? Um, and the SUMI indicators have been designed to, to help you uh, on this and to provide you with inspiration on how to how to measure uh, the success of the SMP. Um, and so they really help you to identify strengths and weaknesses of uh, your mobility system and identify areas for improvement. Um, so the um, main advantage uh, from our point is that it's standardized um, at the EU level, which allows for comparisons with other cities. So if everybody uses a different methodology, then 
you can have you can track progress over time in your own city, but you can't compare with other cities how you're really doing at a European level compared to cities of similar size. And this is what the previously mentioned benchmarking tool, which is available from the DG Move website, or actually currently it's down, but it will be available again, um, which really helps you to locate yourself uh, in comparing with cities of similar size. Um, so quickly on the on the uh, Sumi One project, um, which uh, ran. 2018 to mid-2020. Um, so the starting point of the project was an indicator set that had been developed by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and he, we have been asked in this project to test these indicators with, uh, with cities across Europe. So at the start of the project um, we realized um, together with uh, staff from different DGs across uh, the uh, European Commission as well as um, a scientific council that we uh, had established that uh, this indicator set should be revised to a certain extent and Europeanized, uh, which was uh, the first task we've did. Uh, and after these, uh, this revision process, um, we have then supported uh, altogether 46 uh, cities across Europe, and some of them are here, um, which is great, uh, to, to provide, uh, to test these indicators, so to calculate them, and then afterwards to collect the learnings from the cities and urban areas um, and on this basis prepare recommendations for the European Commission uh, on how to uh, revise the indicator set uh, in the future and um, what we have also done, we've developed the benchmarking tool. Um, so, um, oh, that's basically what I've mentioned, so you can have a look at more detail when you download the slides. Um, so the Indicators, uh, this is the list of the indicators we have uh, in SUMI 1. We have uh, um, distinguished between core indicators and non-core indicators, so uh, those that are really crucial to measure the success of, SM, of an SMP and the state of the mobility system in the city and those that perhaps are uh, nice to have in addition but they're not essential. Um, but. Okay, I just wanted to give you an example of what an indicator looks like. This is, for example, the indicator opportunity for active mobility. So for every indicator, we have a definition. In this case, it's the infrastructure for active mobility, so walking and cycling. Uh, then the parameters, uh, which basically is the calculation methodology in order to arrive um, at a specific indicator score at the end. It, uh, it always calculates a score between 0 and 10, so uh, 10 for uh, best performance. Um, and um, for every indicator, we're also providing uh, the, the calculation methodology and, and a user guide, um, which is in an Excel sheet, so everybody can really use it. And this is, for example, what an Excel sheet look, look, uh, looks like, so pretty small, but there's always the blue cells to fill in the figures. Um, and of course, this is the challenge for each city. Do you have available the data in order to fill in these indicators? For some, it's not very difficult. Usually cities have this data available. For other kin indicators, uh, it's uh, perhaps a little bit more of a challenge. Um, so the experiences that we have collected at the end of the project, which are part of the final recommendations, is that um, the indicators uh, within the cities have led to a lot of new insights because sometimes the data has been collected for the first time and through this endeavor also uh, the staff in the city administration and uh, other organizations, organizations the cities have worked with have really le led to development of new competences, which was a really positive feedback from the cities. Um, but some of the data was uh, perceived as difficult uh, to, to get and to obtain, uh, also sometimes expensive to get the data. Um, um, but the cities have often build up new um, connections with institutions, other organizations who have data which they probably weren't aware of before or at, lot, at least not in this level of detail and really have established work relationships uh, which are very important. Um, also the external support that we provided from the project uh, by giving suggestions on where to find data and so, uh, and so on was perceived as helpful so this is now being continued. Uh, and there was a great interest from the cities uh, to really compare with similar cities, so to benchmarking. 
to benchmarking. Um, but <clears throat> as you have mentioned, Robert, um, the revisions of the indicators is now a key activity of the so-called SUMI2 project. Um, so we're currently revising these indicators based on the feedback from the cities to reduce really the challenges that some of the cities have had in calculating these indicators. Um, we're redefining the scaling because uh, over these years, especially with the publication of the uh, mobility framework, uh, new policy goals and objectives from the European Commission have been formulated which are being taken up. So the scaling sometimes changes. So when does a city achieve the highest value of uh, indicator score of 10? Um, this has partly been changed. And as you've mentioned, we're supporting, or the objective is to support the 100 mission cities through different means. There will be an, a secretariat for general questions, but we will provide bilateral uh, assistance through uh, so-called indicator mentors, or so really specialists on the indicators um, to help uh, in, during the calculation procedure, there will be a financial uh, support mechanism, a so-called data acquisition fund. We will have uh, training activities, webinars, e-courses, and so on. And we'll update the benchmarking tool as well, and mentioned, uh, you mentioned already the topic guide. Um, so this is my second to last slide, I think, already. Um, so the decision has been taken already on which will be the core indicators. I've shown you the long list uh, for the SUMI1 project. So this has been really condensed now to seven indicators, which are those that are included in the 10T regulation. And the other indicators, uh, so the 12 other indicators, um, will be differentiated into so-called second level and optional indicators, but this process is uh, currently ongoing. Um, and the state of play is, um, so we've now contacted, invi invited all the mission cities to work with us. Uh, there has uh, been quite some positive feedback already. A few are not yet getting back. So if you are here from a mission city, please approach us afterwards. We're happy to provide you with some more information. Um, and um, what uh, should be mentioned is um, already this decision has been taken as well. Um, that in SUMI 1, the requirement was always to collect data at urban area level. Um, which is also in line with the 10T regulation. But nevertheless, uh, what we have realized is that sometimes this data is simply not available. And in order to avoid that, a that an indicator is not calculated at all, it is still better that it is calculated with city level data. So um, while cities are still encouraged to calculate at uh, functional um, area level, these indicators also, uh, when you calculate it with city level data, it nevertheless, uh, um, provides interesting um, results and especially, I mean, ideally, of course, it would be to calculate both at urban area level and city level because the comparison can be quite interesting. Um, so, for example, for the modal split, it's quite obviously that, uh, quite obvious that usually uh, the, uh, the level of, of cars is, is higher for the urban area uh, level uh, due, to, due to the commuters, but for other indicators, it might not be this obvious. So where we are now, we have revised already four of the indicators, those that have been perceived in SUMI 1 as, as rather easy, where there have been a few minor suggestions for revisions which we have implemented, and they're now for uh, sitting with DG Move for the final approval. Um, so we can really get going and start working together with the cities. Um, and we're currently providing uh, a, a discussion paper for options on, on to revise the, the further, um, the remaining indicators. And that's it. Thank you. Can you please take one of the um, okay, so Hans Martin Neumann, please. Could you take one of the other mics so I keep this one for me? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, yeah, good afternoon. I would like to talk about the Net Zero Cities project and the activities around the uh, EU mission on smart and climate neutral cities here. And as you will see, there are strong linkages uh, to, the, to the SUMI indicators and to the discussion of the sustainable urban mobility plans. So uh, let me start with a word about myself. Uh, my name is Hans Martin Neumann. I'm a practitioner turned researcher and then turned practitioner again. Uh, when I started this journey here for Net Zero Cities, I was uh, thematic coordinator at AIT, Austrian Institute of Technology. 
uh, and we submitted with many other partners the, uh, the Net Zero Cities project and won it. Um, in the meantime, I've actually changed my position. I'm now Urban Development Director of the City of Linz in, in Austria, in Upper Austria. And, uh, but I'm still, uh, of course, working on urban mobility issues. I'm overseeing there also the work of the urban mobility department. And I'm advising Net Zero Cities project uh, on the development of the indicators. That was actually my, my research focus uh, in the last 10 years. Uh -huh. Okay. Let me just see exactly. Um, well, I think you are probably all familiar with the EU mission on smart and climate neutral cities. This is a, a major initiative that should make more than 100 cities in, uh, well, support more than 100 cities, I think it's total 112, uh, to become climate neutral within the next, well, not even 10 years until 2030, it's only seven years left. Um, and it is uh, yeah, one of the, the five EU missions that mo mobilize at the moment a lot of research and innovation funding. Uh, for these activities to, to implement the EU Green Deal. Um, and uh, at the next step also, well, it should, of course, bundle ongoing activities like the SUMS, like the SUMIs in the cities and uh, leverage uh, these activities by, in the next step, attracting uh, also private capital and to, to bundle investments to, to make climate neutrality in cities happen. Uh, well, how can climate neutrality be achieved? This is, of course, something that is not cannot be done by a single technology or by a single change in governance or by a single measure at all. Uh, you need to follow what we call in the project impact pathways. You need to identify where the, the levers are that you can use, what the main areas of uh, interventions are in your city based on an analysis, of course, of uh, well, where the main sources of greenhouse gas emissions are. And then you need to step by step walk you, uh, well, work you through uh, all the barriers uh, in order to, uh, well, achieve a tr system transformation uh, that allows a uh, city to run uh, to its operations in a climate neutral way. And this is something that is done in an iterative way. It cannot not happen overnight. Uh, and it requires also monitoring because you will have several interventions. Some of them will work out, some others will not. So monitoring is really a very important aspect of the whole journey towards climate neutrality. Well, uh, monitoring needs to be embedded. We therefore have developed uh, what we call an impact framework or also uh, sometimes we call it the theory of change. This diagram behind us here shows uh, how this uh, works, what the steps are that from our point of view need to be uh, analyzed, need to be taken into account. On the left-hand side, you see that climate neutrality is, of course, about reducing emissions, no? carbon emissions and uh, emissions of other greenhouse gases. And these emissions come from specific sectors of the economy, mobility being one of the, well, most important ones, the most prominent ones. So you need to start with an analysis of these sectors and then develop sector-specific approaches. But just looking at technologies within the sectors is not enough. You also need to think about what are the, well, conditions, the social conditions, the economic conditions that are necessary for the system transformations. And this is what we call his systemic levers. This includes technological innovation. It includes changes in governance and policy. Uh, it includes uh, participation because uh, if you don't involve your citizens, they will not support this climate neutrality agenda. Uh, it uh, includes uh, very importantly finance and funding. Yeah, I've already mentioned that new ways of finances, uh, financing are needed to make cities climate neutral. And finally, learning and capability, capabilities in order to uh, ensure mainstreaming of the innovations and the learnings from the uh, climate neutrality process. Then, uh, well, for each of these uh, domains, and if, well, also considering the levers, you will then um, define your measures and you will observe the changes over time. Um, Short-term changes, early changes after one to two years, later outcomes after four years, which is the duration of the Net Zero Cities project. And uh, we are also interested in seeing what the long-term perspective, meaning the perspective after 2030 is, of course. So uh, we will ask cities at least to do an estimation of the impacts by 2030 at the end of the project. So I think that I've already explained this. This is how you can also look at it. So first of all, you need to define what will be done. Uh, these are the interventions. Then you need to think about uh, what needs to be, what is necessary to make these changes happen. And uh, in order to be sure where you are in the process, you need to look at the 
uh, at your progress. You need to do progress monitoring and in the end impact monitoring that will tell you whether you have achieved climate neutrality in your city or not. So, and our monitoring, evaluation, and learning framework, as we call it, is structured according to these steps in the process. We start with an assessment of the emission domains. This is what many cities have done already uh, within the, uh, um, the SECAPs, the Sustainable Energy and Climate Action Plans. Also, as we have learned in uh, the Sustainable Earth Mobility Plan, this is uh, nowadays an important topic. This is the starting point, and this is also where the indicators, well, some indicators from the SUMI framework will be certainly integrated. We will also create linkages with the ongoing reporting mechanisms, already established reporting mechanisms uh, of My Covenant uh, and of uh, CDP and ICLE. Uh, we are closely working together with them. Then also what needs to be observed uh, as uh, the city proceeds with this agenda is the systemic levers. This is something that, in our point of view, is important to understand why changes happen or why they do not happen, why project uh, implementation measures succeed or why they do not succeed. Uh, so therefore, um, we recommend cities to also do a qualitative monitoring of the systemic levers, not just a quantitative one of the emissions. And we have translated this journey into uh, the framework that you can see here. So this is basically the structure of the, of the indicator system that we are at the moment working on. So we have the, so what we call the direct benefits. These are basically the, the savings in greenhouse gas emissions. We have the co-benefits. Oh, I need to explain this. I have not done it yet. Uh, many of the measures taken towards climate neutrality generate uh, benefits for society, for the economy, for the, for the cities that go beyond just mere emission reduction. Uh, it, for example, um, it can be a reduction of air pollution. If you reduce uh, car traffic, you will also have less air pollution, but just uh, less greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it might be more attractive urban space. It might be a more inclusive society. Uh, these are what we call a co-benefit, and we think it's also important to, to, re to record them uh, and to communicate them clearly uh, to show uh, well, the, the impact of the mission. And finally, we have the systemic levers of change. Uh, which need to be uh, obs well followed and observed over time in order to have a kind of a validation of what works and what, what does not work out. Uh, this is the, the conceptual framework that we have developed within uh, Net Zero Cities for monitoring, evaluation and learning. Uh, you might wonder where the link is to the SUMI now. It's obviously uh, in the well report in greenhouse gas, uh, in the, in the in the, on the indicators on the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from transport. No, this is clear. This is an obvious link. But I think also in other regards, uh, for example, uh, the, the accessibility indicators I, I would consider very important here because they also have a social dimension, um, participation, uh, and other topics that are covered by by SUMI indicators are also covered by our framework. And we are working closely together with Ruprecht uh, by in the development, in the construction, and later on in the testing of this indicator framework, and with several other partners that bring in the specific expertise from other European projects in order to have a, a consistent uh, monitoring, evaluation, and learning approach uh, across uh, Europe with maybe different foci depending on the project where we are working. So uh, I would also, well, this is work in progress at the moment. We are, as I said, we are filling now the indicators for the different dimensions. Most of them have been defined already, and we are at the moment describing them and working on the calculations rules. Uh, the whole system should be ready at the beginning of the year, and then it will go into the testing phase. Um, I would also just like to mention that uh, we are um, advising cities uh, not only on which indicators to use, there will be also contact persons for that, but also which steps to take in the monitoring process. I think that is a very classical wheel uh, that would also work for the SUMI indicators more or less. You start with uh, identifying your priorities, then you define, um, uh, or you start with a scoping exercise, then you define your goals and priorities, then you select based on that indicators, and we will provide a menu from which you can choose. Now, this is what we're working in at the moment. This is this MEL framework. And then later on, you uh, will choose data availability, collect data, uh, identify data sources, and do the monitoring and reporting. Uh, for this, Net Zero Cities will also provide an infrastructure. There are so-called city advisors that will closely work with cities uh, in order to ensure that uh, this does not get does not cause uh, headaches for you, but it's something that should work smoothly. And uh, we are trying to achieve as much, um, I would say, consistency and alignment with existing reporting systems and indicators as possible. 
Finally, uh, when, well, when to report, yeah, this is also important. Um, we are thinking about three points in time, one after two years. At the moment, actually, we are at the end of year one. One at the end of net zero cities after four years, and we will also ask cities to provide a long-term outlook until the year of 2030. Uh, and uh, this, the whole uh, reporting should be done on, an, on a platform that is currently being developed by other project partners. Uh, we are also thinking about what to do in case there are data gaps. This is similar to, to what uh, Marcel has just described. We might allow to some reporting based on, on city level data uh, that is uh, available on statistics, statistics platforms. And we will also um, construct um, uh, linkages and interfaces with existing reporting systems like the one from CDP, uh, platforms like the one from, from CDP ECLE and from My Covenant. Um, this is also in the process, um, I would say, I hope we will have a, a functioning platform after year two, this is the, the aim at the moment, but it certainly will need some, some thorough testing and evaluation until it's fully, uh, fully functional. Yeah, and with this I would like to close and, and thank you very much and I think we will have later on a discussion about this indicator framework and the SUMI and everything else that will now be presented. Thank you very much. And thank you, thank you for the for the presentations until now. I think we have seen two examples of of indicators and how what what other system is being developed and prepared for for cities to capture what's going on in inside them in terms of mobility, and and I think we will come to the most interesting presentations. <laughs> Actually, what did it look like for a city to work with indicators and to define and and get all this data and then to see what we can learn. From, from them. So I think I will start with Mikiel at the moment, uh, at the beginning, from, from Antwerp. So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michiel Pellem. I'm from the city of Antwerp. We are active in uh, several European projects, such as ScaleUp, SunPlus, Mobimix, Pioneers, and FastTrack. Today I would like to talk to you about how we work with indicators, at the city of Antwerp and what we think of Zoom. So I want to start by pointing out that Antwerp is absolutely convinced that indicators are essential for a city. Antwerp has been working with indicators for more than 10 years. We have a public dashboard in which you can check indicators on a lot of interesting subjects, from education to health, and of course, mobility. You can look up numbers for the whole city or specific areas. We call them districts in our city. Out of the 150 indicators we have, more than 30 are about mobility. We have modal split, uh, but I will talk about that later. Road allocation, for example, how much of our roads uh, have which speed limits. Satisfaction about, for example, the amount of cycling paths, parking spots, or about availability of uh, public transport. We know how much roads there are for pedestrians and cyclists, how much parking spots or charging points we have for cars, and so on. And what's also important is a percentage of people who have a multimodal hub uh, in less than five or 15 minutes of walking or cycling. But, of course, what about uh, Sumi? For this presentation today, I was asked to focus on uh, these three indicators. indicators. That's congestion, uh, modal split, which was yeah, rather a parameter in Sumi 1. And the third one, I think it's not on this slide, but it's greenhouse gas emissions. So, first things first, I will start with congestion. This is the formula and definition uh, to calculate the SUMI indicator congestion. I don't know how it looks for you, but for me, it looks rather complex. And unfortunately, I can't give you the result for Antwerp. I can't give you the congestion and delay index for Antwerp. Please let me explain um, some of our remarks about this indicator. Firstly, uh, quite a lot of data isn't available. It's the number of car trips um, during peak hours, car travel time during peak hours, or off-peak car travel time. And the data that is available about public transport is rather per line and not per area. So it's not possible to take conclusions on city level. What we do have is this. But it doesn't help for calculating the SUMI indicator congestion. We have traffic jam length in kilometers on main corridors, although that's Flemish data, regional data, not from the city. Congestion, by which we mean the time of traffic jams, for example, 30 minutes delay on main corridors, 
although that's also Flemish data, not from the city. And so public transport per line, not per area. And it's only for bus and tram, not for train. And it's an average. So then there is the second issue. In the definition, the focus lies on main road corridors. So no uh, secondary roads. That means for Antwerp, we could uh, focus on, for example, the highways you see on this map. It's a screenshot of our website, Smart Ways to Antwerp, um, and it's taken on a regular Monday or early afternoon. As you can see, most of the highways are green, that means smooth traffic. But what we don't take into account, if you look at this, is uh, all the secondary roads inside our city. This screenshot was taken at exactly the same time as the previous one, and as you can see, it gives a different view of traffic in our city with more uh, red and yellow roads. Last issue with congestion indicator I would like to address is the clear fact that it's a complex model, which isn't easy to understand. And it builds further on other indica indicators or parameters, mo uh, such as modal split, which makes, an, yeah, makes any issues with modal split only bigger. But I will zoom in on that one immediately. To conclude, this part about congestion, these are the three obvious remarks for the city of Antwerp. The data is not uh, available or not available on city level. Secondary roads aren't included. It's a complex model building on, for example, modal split. Next thing I would like to address is modal split. This is the definition in uh, SUMI. And we are able to calculate this indicator, although we have some issues with the data behind it. For passenger mobility, we have to look uh, on uh, a more regional level to Flemish data. Those numbers are hard to scale down to our city without facing statistical issues. For freight, we only have a part of the requested data, um, but let's first zoom in on the, uh, um, on the modal split we calculated in SUMI. That's this one. It's a modal split of 50-50, right on target for our city and our functional urban area. But let's take a closer look to the modal split results we calculated on a more detailed level with our own data. Let's start with personal travel and then talk about freight. So, for personal travel, we get a total different reality with big differences between target groups. These modal splits are calculated based on surveys with each more than 2,000 respondents. What you can see here is that leisure activities are mostly done on a smart way with only 27% taking the car. For commuters, the modal split in 2020 was 43% car, 57% other modes of transport. For visitors, it's more or less 50-50. But by focusing on different target groups, we notice the most work has to be done in a functional urban area. There are still 60% of car users there, and we really think this gives a totally different and more relevant view on our mobile split of, yeah, let's say, the city and the area around it. In SUMI, freight is also calculated. Uh, this could be our freight model split, but as you can see on the bottom of the slide, it's only an educated guess. We actually don't know. We don't know how many trucks or cargo bikes uh, with freight are moving around in the city of Antwerp. We simply don't have those numbers. What we do have is this. Port of Antwerp has the number of containers leaving the port via road, rail, and water. But once again, it gives a different view than our own uh, guess or the SUMI indicator. Last indicator I would like to address uh, very shortly is the greenhouse gas emissions. I won't dive in, uh, into deeply, but I can say we're able to calculate this SUMI indicator, and uh, this is our result. It's 1.35 tons of CO2, CO2 per capita per year. But once again, it was uh, hard and probably not entirely possible to calculate this number correctly. That's because some data wasn't available at all, some data wasn't available on city level, and um, yeah, we are still working with a complex model based on other parameters or indicators such as uh, modal speech, which I discussed before. So, to conclude, um, our recommendations. The recommendation of a city which has been working with indicators for over uh, 10 years. So, do promote the use of indicators to monitor and evaluate uh, the work that cities do. But assure cities own and understand these indicators both on a political and administrative level, and how to do that. By avoiding complex models informally, keep it simple. By providing guidelines on sound methodologies, 
to avoid flawed and unreliable, unreliable data by incorporating simple input indicators, for example, HR budget, and throughput indicators, for example, processes or governance, by involving national, regional levels, uh, and for example, looking at a functional urban area. And I think by rebuilding the SUMI indicators bottom-up, uh, and we hope that will be the case with SUMI 2, of course. Uh, thanks for your attention, and to be clear, it's no real kisses that are given, but my clear request to you all, keep it simple. Thank you. Thank you very much for the interesting and honest feedback on, on, on the work done and the challenges ahead. Everybody knows this is not an easy piece of cake to, 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 to make it happen. That's the whole idea behind. We are on a journey here together. So, Diana from Budapest, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Diana Kimmer from, um, from BKK, uh, Center for Budapest Transport. Um, and today I will be talking about uh, both a little bit uh, about the whole monitoring system that we use and we are currently revising, and I will also go in depth with two of the indicators. So a little bit of history of our um, SUMP in Budapest, because the monitoring system is a very essential part of the, uh, of the SUMPs. The first um, development transport system development plan um, was created in 2009. Uh, it was overlooked by the municipality and was created by an external designer company. Uh, then we created in 2015 the Balazs Moore plan, which uh, was the first plan that was following um, principles of the SUMPs, but this plan only contained the objectives and the measures. And then in 2019, we have adopted a full sum, meaning that it both has the measures at the objectives, but also the monitoring system, for example. Um, and um, since last year, we are currently in the phase of revising the, the, the sum, which is called the Budapest Mobility Plan, because even though it was adopted in 2019, most of the work was done in 2017 and 2018, so we felt a need to, to revise it and hence we are also revising the monitoring system. So one of the most important criteria for indicators is being smart. So have specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timed uh, indicators. And the old uh, monitoring system that we use or that we had in place were violating a few of these uh, criteria. But I will come back to this in a moment. Uh, and first of all, I wanted to show you the, the goal matrix of the Budapest Mobility Plan, the SUMP of Budapest. Because as I told you, the monitoring system has to be a very integrated part of the SUMPs as well. So first, we have to understand the goals that we have. Um, you can see here that we have a sort of matrix made out of a two-tier system, having the strategy goals on the first tier. So we have three different strategy goals. And then we have four intervention areas. Um, which and in the intersects you can see the so-called operative objectives and then the measures are linked to these operative objectives. So it came very handy to have this two-tier system of, um, uh, of the goals because guess what also has a two-tier system? The SUMI indicators. Um, so here you can see on the right-hand side the old uh, monitoring uh, system and the different indicators. And the first problem that we have faced uh, was that we have more than 300 indicators, which was neither specific nor re relevant, and we didn't have the capacity to measure all of them. Um, so we used to have a five-tier system. On the fifth tier, we had uh, indicators for different projects that we completely scrapped, because why it's very important to monitor projects, but it does not need to be done on the strategic level. It needs to be done at different parts of the company and at, at different um, parts of the investments, but it's um, for sure not something for the strategic level. So we completely scrapped that part. Uh, then to measure um, our different measures, um, we decided not to use indicators, but because all of the measures are linked to different projects, um, we will see how far we are getting in those different measures by seeing how many projects we can sort of tick off and, and, and how many projects we have actually implemented. And then we were left with three um, 
three levels, three tiers that we could um, um, sort of combine and arrive to the two tier system, which is the SUMI core and non core uh, indicator system. Um, so here you can see how we linked the, the different indicators to the strategic objectives and the intervention areas. I highlighted with blue the, the SUMI indicators and with purple the, the, the other indicators uh, because why SUMI indicators are encompassing a very a lot of topics, uh, but we felt the need to include some more indicators uh, to properly monitor the, the, the strategy goals and the intervention areas that we have set out in, uh, in our SUMP. Um, so now I will go into uh, detail with two indicators. Uh, me as well, I will be talking about the model split, but I think it will be very interesting to, to compare the two cities. Um, so we actually did an extensive uh, revision of our model split indicator last year because we have faced some challenges. Um, first and foremost, um, we do not have the, the, the digital capacity to calculate a model split just yet, so we are actually using household surveys. We are piloting many uh, different methodologies and digital tools to be able to get to the point where we do not need household surveys, but we still use surveying techniques. This doesn't mean that we don't have data on passenger numbers, on car numbers, on cyclists, but we are not confident enough to have a, a model split number that is representative for the city itself. And unfortunately, for example, we have no data on pedestrians. Um, so we are still using the surveying methods, um, for which reason we have also discussed not to have a model split every year, not to calculate one every year, because it's a very robust number. To have even two percentage points uh, of change, you need a lot of investment and a lot of work. So maybe it will be enough to calculate it only every um, second year, and then you can also um, be a little bit smarter about your financing. Um, we also did some minor things, um, uh, increasing the sample size, uh, uh, we revised the timing um, of the survey and, and the survey questions as well. But um, one of the, uh, the key things um, is that we had a lot of conversations about what should be the metrics. If we should calculate models that based on the length of the journeys or based on trip numbers. Um, because you can see it's not evident, you can get very different numbers, and uh, this might be a recommendation for the model split to find a same metric. Because right now you can put different uh, model split numbers from different cities and they will look completely different, and, and, and you can really feel that the methodology behind is, is just not the same and it's impossible to, to compare them. Um, so while the data collection methodology can differ and that's, and that's completely normal, but we have to have uh, uh, the same metrics uh, for model split across Europe. Uh, I think I have some technical difficulties. I only have one slide left. <laughs> yes, thank you, yes. Um, so the other indicator is the access to mobility service indicator, which if you have worked with the, with the SUMI indicators, you will know that um, this indicator is quite uh, complex to calculate. Um, because the indicator, um, so the indicator basically measures, if you have not seen it yet, basically measures the accessibility to public transportation. But it takes two different layers, it takes frequency and distance as well. Um, and we believe that we, we try to simplify uh, this, um, this indicator a little bit because it was just very, very complicated to, to calculate and we had capacity issues. So we thought that um, the frequency layer is not 
that much uh, needed because when you measure, so basically here you can see a map where you take all the public transportation stops, draw a f uh, 500 meter circle around them and calculate how many people live in that area. Um, so this one only takes the distance layer and um, we are not dealing with the frequency layer because obviously in, in, in areas where you have a higher population density, frequency will be higher as well. So because the two, these two variables correlate, uh, this kind of controls for, for frequency, so um, therefore you can use this methodology. The frequency layer is also used to distinguish between backbone service and, and, and other services, so uh, the indicator requires higher frequency for trams, trains, uh, metros, and less frequency for buses, um, but um, we have a separate indicator for that. So we do the same kind of exercise that you can see here, but only for the backbone um, service because we believe that it's, uh, it's very important to have these two in indicators separately and have a generate idea on um, gen gen general accessibility to public, uh, public transport and then accessibility to, um, to, uh, to the backbone services. Yeah, this, this is on our side, so thank you so much. Thank you for the presentation. In the last testimony from Stella Altonen from Turku. Yeah, nice to be here with all of you. I'm giving a presentation that is focused on project approach. So my name is Stella Altonen. I work for the city of Turku and I'm coordinating two projects, Scale Up and UserG. And this time I'm looking at the Scale Up project and how we address the different SUVI indicators in that context. So scale-up project has been mentioned several times in here. What we are looking is to combining the physical, uh, user-friendliness and digital layers together, together with the cities of Antwerp and Madrid. So in here we, we looked at the, what are the measures in the project and how could we actually approach the different zoom indicators and in using, using that as a framework as, or a, as, a partly, uh, as a framework for the project. In the case of the city of Turku, we have uh, a lot of our national level indicators that are maybe going back a bit. Yes, we have a, we're involved in a lot of national level indicators in greenhouse, greenhouse gas in, in emissions and air quality and also on models but they are based on the national level in, uh, calculations and also on surveys. So we uh, at that point address the issue so that it's not enough of resources to tackle the SUMI indicators as a product project because the project outcomes don't really have an impact on those actual indicators indicated. We have a large cooperation on a national level with the six biggest cities in Finland and that has been ongoing from 2000, since 2004 and this is really important to raise because we have, have been long tracking of indicator process and working together and I've been partly involved on that for over the years. And what we wanted to this time look is the project indicators so that they would actually look at the new needs to, to be addressed by the project measures. And this is also something that I'd like to raise in here as previous speakers have been showcasing nice reference works for the, well, for the evaluation. We don't ha unfortunately have that yet. So it's a good timing for us to look into these Zoomi requests and how could we actually address this in the city of Turku. So what we found out when we were re having reflections on the SUMI indicators is that, uh, of course, as mentioned before, the comparison between different cities is really important and it gives us a, a European framework. And also somehow I would like to raise also some sort of a peer pressure could come from this system, which is also in favor of actually getting more, more measures in the future. And of course, these spreadsheets that provided are really a useful tool for us to use in the future. But what we are missing is that we would really need to consider the resources and the available, available man manpower to do this all. So actually looking into how these are all related to, uh, to the different co uh, commitments that we have as a city. For example, the SECOP plans, the Covenant of Mayors indicators and national and regional level indicators. And this needs to be clarified because there's a lot of indications as referred to my, by my colleagues here, uh, more, hundreds of indicators. So we really need to be careful on what we are putting the, putting the focus on. And what I'd like to bring is also the visibility of actually uh, uh, 
through, uh, so that we can link the strategies and the measures towards actually getting some things done is really important. So bringing out to the, to the public to see where we are with the indicators is really vital. Uh, what we reflect is, is that there's a lot, quite a lot of unavailable data on several of these indicators, especially in our case, like the previous speakers were addressing, and we need to have more resources to be focusing on this indicator work. Uh, as being a relatively small city, a city of 190,000 inhabitants, we don't have the resources as the previous colleagues were addressing earlier. And then, of course, some of the data collections need uh, larger surveys, and this has been really something that we really need to be justifying really carefully. But then I would like to address two different indicators that we, uh, that we, uh, it's a really uh, fast machine here. Uh, so what I'd like to address, one is that we have a Turku Regional SAMP that was established in 2020, and this focuses on, on functional urban area with 13 different municipalities. And in this Regional SAMP, we have indicators as part of the transport system category in the, in the uh, SAMP process, and what we are, have is uh, some of them are partly compatible with the SUMI indicators, which is, which is good, but uh, some are not. So, and one of the things that is really compatible is, is the tar target under the safe and healthy traffic, which is the number of road deaths. And this has been followed already now. So the definition of road, road deaths is, is quite, quite clear in here. And what we also calculated is on, on the urban, functional urban area, the same indicators, and ad addressing also the latest SUMI recommendations, for including seriously injured as part of the calculation. So you can see them here. What we have as a, a follow-up system for the regional SAMP is that we have an online tool that you can also already see av available data and how it has been evolved in different municipalities. And here you can have a picture of how it's actually occurring to different model splits. So even a further detailed data is available on that. What I'd like to bring here is, uh, is one of the, not the core indicators, but one of the indicators that is really, uh, really functioning for, on the project levels is this multimodal integration. It's a it's an, uh, way of showcasing that actually the, during the, even the, during the project scope lifetime, we are actually able to showcase a difference and a development, which is really important. So we calculated the index. Uh, in 2021, and already now when we were recalculated just for this presentation is that it has actually increased because of the bike sharing system has been, has been added to these uh, inter intersections that we are basing the calculations on. So actually this is really motivational, and what I'd like to bring as a, as a closing one is good to have also easier indicators for the measures so that actually you are seeing the results on actual implementation taking place, because a lot of these complex indicators are actually years and years of work behind it and a complex set of measures, and you don't know what actually impacted what the most. So I'd really like to point out that the, having the, uh, those measure indicators present also as a, as a set that really motivate the practical workers is really, really vital. Thank you for, my, for the attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the very interesting presentations. And I think we are open to, to questions from, from the audience and online as well. I think we can put the slide on the screen if there is already something in it. Yes, definitely. very technical questions for a technical topic. Anybody feels the urge to take one of the questions? I would like to reply to the first question, which is about uh, wouldn't it be better to have some more human-centered indicators that reflect quality of life? Uh, I think that is important, but I think it is something that is easier to discuss on a project level than on a city level. Uh, so we, are well, well, we will certainly consider something like that for the in Net Zero Cities for the evaluation of so-called pilot projects, which is a part of the initiative. But I think on the city level, it's a bit difficult to do this. No? So therefore, my, my suggestion would be uh, to, to approach it this way and maybe also as an idea for, for future Sumi generations 
uh, I think for the for the evaluation of projects, this is more relevant than on the city scale. Maybe just one thing also for the first question, because I absolutely um, agree that not on only the SUMI, SUMI indicators, but um, in most of the work we have to be more human centric. Uh, but I think even some of the system focused indicators can cater and provide um, to this question. So we have um, an indicator, for example, in our monitoring system, it's not a SUMI one, but it's, it's, it's another one that we have implemented, that is the livability of uh, streets. And it's very subjective what you call livability, obviously, and we tackle it from what kind of data we have. Um, but we will measure um, car traffic, and if it's a, a 30 kilometer per hour um, segment of the city, if we have bike lanes. So even if it's system focused, it has some uh, elements of, of being human centric. And another thing, um, um, again, something that we have added to the accessibility indicator is that um, uh, the, the technological and digital accessibility, because in the SUMIs right now, there is an accessibility indicator for, for physical accessibility, but we also have to think about um, um, digital accessibility and, and, and accessibility of um, applications and websites and, and so on and so forth. So maybe for Antwerp also on the first one, we also have satisfaction for example, which is, I think, important. We also see that uh, people cycling are the most happy commuters, for example. In, indeed. I think, if I may try to answer for the third and the, the fourth question, I mean, our idea, and I think what we hear the most is that we need to simplify. So at the moment, we are not considering expanding and adding more layers. Obviously, cities can and do collect, uh, collect data to, to feed their information needs, but from our perspective, from, from the Commission's and European perspective, we, will, we are definitely not in the way of adding more and more and more. We are trying to simplify and make it easier. <laughs> so that's, uh, but it's also very important, and we saw the case of Antwerp, but actually it can definitely complement the knowledge and fine tune and, 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 and provide very important and helpful feedback for model share, for example, to know exactly the territory, what you're talking about, the groups, uh, you, you are talking about, but at, at our perspective, we are not ex expecting to go in that, that direction at the moment. Yeah, maybe I can add one thing which uh, has been mentioned before. As you have seen, some of the feedback from the cities has been uh, also pointing out the challenges that have been there uh, in the in the SUMI one phase, and uh, I hope that not. Too many cities got afraid now <laughs> from these presentations. Um, and I just wanted to point out again, it is the objective now in the SUMI2 project that we are revising the indicators based on the feedback that we've received. So what you have heard today is basically a fraction of the indicators as they were at the end of the SUMI1 project. So we are taking this into account uh, and we're also uh, having an, uh, an an internal body to uh, to discuss uh, the uh, revisions that are being done, um, and we hope that it will then be easier to calculate the indicators. But nevertheless, um, we cannot just make it too simple, um, because otherwise the data becomes not relevant anymore, and the indicator uh, as such. I mean. Of course, for congestion, you, you can just say, oh, there's the TomTom index, just use that. But the calculation methodology behind this wouldn't be valuable for you as a city um, when you only have data based on, uh, from Google uh, that people use uh, to travel in their private cars. It doesn't provide you any information about uh, the, for example, on freight, uh, which is becoming increasingly important in cities uh, on how to how to tackle freight transport. So um, we have to find a way to uh, to really arrive at meaningful uh, data sets and with the parameters included that you also can draw conclusions uh, from the calculation methodology. So if you look at, okay, why are we not performing well? Um, the calculation methodology helps you 
to identify which are the why the indicator score is low. So just on, on this background. Thank you. Uh, I'm just to present myself. I'm Dirk Engels, uh, working for transport and mobility in the SUMI2 project. And I just want to illustrate a bit what Marcel just said in relation to one of the concerns expressed by the cities. Uh, in general, of course, I think I can speak on behalf of my colleagues also, and, and, and Marcel indicated it also, that yeah, we really are very happy with all the comments from the cities because indeed we all are convinced that we have to make indicators which are feasible, meaningful and, and, and significant, but feasible also, of course. Uh, and, but I just want to uh, go into one element mentioned here. In the advices, for instance, from the city of Antwerp, it was indicated that they really want to simplify things and also build uh, indicators bottom-up and we had the example of the model split indicator. And I, I, I can uh, give you this, this, uh, this confidence, maybe, to the future, that for the moment, uh, this uh, model split indicator will be an important indicator. And so we are happy that it is one of the core indicators. But we build it up bottom up. This means that we will focus. And there are, there are little possibilities still that will be discussed in, but with the cities further on but we will focus on the sh model share of trips and why we do that also, because this is what is more the type of data cities collect anyway. And of course, we have also the challenge there that in many cases, in many cities, these data are collected for different groups of people and different type of trips. For instance, <coughs> separately for people go to work, uh, uh, separately for leisure, and things like that, and so we try to build up the indicator in line with this local experience to make it easy to fill it in and to come to a meaningful uh, operator. I just want to add that as an extra example of the way we try to take into account the, uh, the, the concerns of the cities. Uh, I think, yeah, that's really important. Uh, we have to do that, and otherwise we don't help the cities. In the meantime, while the microphone is walking to the gentleman in the middle, I've seen the second question getting quite a lot of thumbs up on, on the screen. What about smaller and medium cities? And, and who will, how they will have this expertise and, and the resources to, to work with these indicators? Yes, definitely, that's, that we are very much aware of this, that this, uh, this is resource intensive. And obviously, the whole thing has the same approach as for, this, for the sums. It, it should be tailored to the size of, and, and the complexity of the exercise goes together with the, with the size of the city at the same time. So you will not be calculating for a smaller city all the different heavy complex indicators simply because probably you don't need them and, and, and the benefits of getting them are, are not huge. And this rings also connects back to our earlier session this morning on, on, on the brainstorming on the support programs for, uh, for cities, for SUMPs, for planning and implementing SUMPs. And, and the call we had heard for the, over there at that session was that regional and national level, so the member states should organize and help and work together with their cities on their territories to, to understand and, and be able to, to plan and actually implement these plans as, as foreseen. So obviously this is a very, very, very strong message to bring home as well. But the, the question. Uh, hello. Um, I have two short questions. The first one, it seems uh, a very common theme that it's difficult at the municipal level to collect and calculate some of these indicators. Um, I was wondering if there's something in place at the European level or part of the zero net zero cities level that's helping them facilitate that data collection or learn or pay for it. Um, and the second question is, uh, I forgot. So just one. <laughs> Maybe it'll come back. OK. In, in terms of funding, yeah, it boils down to money at the end of the day. I mean, we are at the beginning of the process. I think I explained very briefly the stage approach we are following. So at this point in time, 
we did not mobilize tens of millions of euros to, to do already do this, uh, the, 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 the funding. We want to have uh, as a, a stable set of indicators with a normal set of methodology that's available, calculatable, obtainable reasonably at a reasonable cost and, and at a reasonable uh, effort to, to, to most of the cities. And when we have this understanding, we will go and start uh, testing it again. Yeah, I mean, it's not testing really, but we will start populating it and still fine tune if needed during uh, the, the next year with the, with the colleagues from Ruprecht Consult. And towards the second half and uh, middle of next year, we will launch, we plan to launch the first uh, technical assistance call from, from CEF budget to actually start putting the system together in, in the 10T nodes. I mean, obviously, CEF is limited to the 10T, so this is one of the limitations. If you are an urban node, well, you are lucky. If you are not, you have to lobby your government to put you on the list. <laughs> and yeah, that's it at the moment. And then I can't see further than 2024 for the time being. We will ob obviously continue. We plan to continue. Project. Will the SUMI 2 uh, revision of the indicators try and systematically collect feedback from the cities that have tried and maybe had a difficult time or challenge with the SUMI 1 indicators? It, or, or was that something you mentioned in yeah, a systematic um, way? Because it seems like the challenges are different for each city. Exactly, um, but this is actually what has happened already in SUMI 1. We have uh, had an extensive round of feedback uh, collection uh, mechanisms <laughs> with the cities. We have done uh, uh, surveys, we have done uh, uh, meetings and workshops with the cities that have uh, cooperated in the SUMI 1 project. We have collected all the feedback, analyzed it and uh, developed recommendations uh, to be discussed with the European Commission to be agreed upon now in the SUMI 2 project on what to take into account. So this process has taken place already and uh, of course as I've mentioned earlier this is what we're now taking into account in the revision process the feedback from the 46 cities that have calculated indicators in SUMI 1. Yeah. And I think this is it because time is up for the session. So thank you everyone, thank you for the speakers again and, and the participants uh, for, uh, for staying with us and I wish you a good continuation and good lunch.